you guys, there's still deer at Wolf Prairie. I am so surprised. I thought we were going to come back into Wolf Prairie and we were just going to find like everything dead and oh, there's even tiny things. Oh my gosh, it's a little, oh, he's like, no, I'm snoozing. Is that like a fainting goat? Are you a fainting rabbit? Are you just pretending? Oh my gosh, he's so cute. He's so cute. But welcome back. Welcome back, everyone, to Taito Ecology. So we spent the last couple episodes visiting all of our different biomes, the permanent ones that we're going to have forever and ever, and just kind of see how they shift and change as time goes on. And we are now finally ready to return to our two experimental biomes, the biomes where we are trying to see what it takes to keep a wolf population successfully reproducing and going. So it's been three months since we have last been here, and I am really, really surprised because I thought personally, everything would be dead usually when we have a prairie biome everything is dead but this time around it looks like we not only have prey but we have baby prey <gasps> well i spoke too soon a group of jackrabbits has just died all right so a group of jackrabbits died we'll check that out in a second but there's a lot of jackrabbits over here oh look here's one of the wolves these are one of our prairie wolves you guys and I know that everybody is like so obsessed with wolves. It's one of the most popular animals among our pixel biologists out there, which is why we're doing this wolf experiment to see what it takes. But it looks like the jackrabbits are actually reproducing. Oh, um, well, and it looks like the antelope are being targeted. That's a, that's a dead antelope. Just in case you guys were wondering if he's just sleeping. No, he's dead. All right, so let's see what else is going on. It looks like a lot of these smaller grasses have died off. I thought the smaller grasses would be able to survive, but they haven't. We have the wolves. There's a bunch of bunnies running for their lives. So it looks like the antelope have died off, and it looks like there's a bunch of little bunnies everywhere. And anybody hiding over here? There's some untouched mushrooms in this corner, but otherwise it's pretty bare looking. It's pretty empty looking. So let's see what we can add in to cause the wolf population to be as successful as possible. So let me see what's happened. Groups of jackrabbits have died. The pronghorn antelope has low group population. The mule deer has low population. Apparently they've even been eating the fish. So that's interesting. I don't know if there's any instances of wolves really fishing. So if you guys know of fishing wolves, then let me know because I don't really know of any off the top of my head. Jackrabbits, low population, and mushrooms. The death of many mushrooms. Ah, oh, the deer mice are totally gone. Probably. We'll check on the territory markers. Oh, the prairie dogs. So we're going to have to check. So it looks like they've survived, but have they survived very well? I'm not sure. All right. There's prairie dogs. I do see prairie dogs. So prairie dogs are still here. There's two of them left. And then the antelope on this side seem to be doing okay. The antelope on the... What is that? It's a wolf. <laughs> it looked like a rock. The antelope on this side, not so much. Not so much. There's only two left. And then over here... Only one left, it can't reproduce. It is the end of this species, this end, end of this territory, I should say. So they're not doing very good. But the, nobody is hungry. So it seems like even without having um, a bunch of grass everywhere, a lot of the animals are still surviving. So now let's check in on the most important part of this equation, the wolves, and let's see where they're at. They still have six individuals. They're getting a little bit hungry, so we probably need to increase some food for them. And they aren't going to be ready to reproduce for a very long time. So, all right. Now that we know what they need, I'm actually going to stick some buffalo grass down <laughs> to try to help all of the other species. And then let's see what else we can sneak in. These skunk bush sumacs actually seem to be extremely useful because they're providing a lot of leaf food for our animals. But I don't know how how far we'll really get. And let's put down some heath aster because it's nice looking. I don't know how far we will really get with um, doing an experimental biome like this. It's a lot more fun, to be honest, to smush in as many different species as possible. So I think what we're going to start doing is we will add competitors. So we need to build up this biome. And then I think we'll see what it would be like. We'll try out different competitors. So we'll add in different predators to compete with the wolves. And we'll see how they handle handle it. We'll add in some badgers and see who's going to survive, the badgers or the wolves. And it's not like we're fighting them against each other. We're fighting them in a much more real life manner where they're competing for resources. That competition for resources is one of the baselines of survival for wild creatures. And then eventually we can work our way up to bobcats. So I think that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to actually add in all of the different predators in these kinds of two experimental biomes that we're running. 
And we're just going to see who comes out on top. We're going to see which one ends up being the one that gets to survive and thrive. Is that a tiny little baby bunny? It is. Baby bunny, I am going to make your life so much better. Look, now you have a bunch of grass around you. Oh, I love doing that. I love it when you can just like find the tiny little sleeping ones. And it can be like, hey, you. You adorable thing. Do you want some prairie blazing stars? So let's go ahead and add in more low-level herbivores. All right, there you go. Oh, look at the little bunny. He's got his own little patch of flowers to sleep in. Ah, oh, that's so cute. No, where are you going? I just gave you a patch of flowers. Come eat it. Come eat it. Oh, he's so adorable. But yeah, we're going to add in more prey items. So the antelope are really having a hard time. I guess there's not enough antelope. And the deer mice are totally gone. So we'll add in deer mice. We'll add in maybe some more antelope. What would the badger eat? The badger is kind of an omnivore. I'm surprised that we don't have more snakes, but I don't know if snakes, carnivores, carnivores, I don't know if they're going to focus on eating ah, frogs. We should add in some frogs. I wonder if, do, do the wolves eat frogs? We are going to find out. There's only one way to find out. And that's by putting down some decomposers, some good old decomposers. Look at those. Look at the little worms. Ah, oh, they're so cute. Look at them wiggle around. Fun fact, when it is raining outside and I walk across like the parking lot or tarmac, I actually will spend like half an hour sometimes trying to rescue the worms from drowning. And I know it sounds like the stupidest thing ever, but I actually really can't just walk away when they don't they don't know any better they're just little worms and they get stuck in the parking lot so yes i do rescue worms and it's probably it's probably a waste of my time and resources but i can't help myself so yes i, I do do that all right so we'll try adding in some frogs and then let's give the frogs some ants to eat because the ants are also scavengers who can help us out oh looks like the bunnies are coming over they're ready to get some food themselves all right, maybe, uh, no, we weren't We weren't gonna add in any trees. That was one of the things we were trying to avoid was not putting too many trees in. I do kind of want to put more prairie blazing stars over here, but honestly, I should be putting something else down, like the honey mesquite, probably a little cluster of honey mesquite because that actually offers a lot of fruit and a lot of leaves. Honey mesquite, why don't you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Their bean pods are consumed by many herbivores. Some eat the mesquite's leaves as well. The mesquite tree provides much needed shade in the desert, as well as a safe nesting site for animals like birds. I would love if we had birds in Taito Ecology. I would be thrilled beyond belief. The branches are covered with small, sharp thorns, which, which discourage larger predators from climbing them. Ah, oh, so that would be a pretty good place to go if you're like a bird building a nest. Oh, cool, we got some money. If you're a bird building a nest to kind of be tucked up out of the way and it'd be like you had a little natural moat almost, uh, you know, like a defensive, that's what I'm trying to say, like a natural defense course that snakes or other things trying to climb up here would have to go through first. All right, there are many types of mesquite tree. The word mesquite comes from the Spanish word Maquets. I can't, I can't, I'm sorry. I'm really good with Asian languages. I'm not good with Latin languages. This word is based off a word in Natali, which is a language spoken by the Aztec people of Central America. Other English words that come from Natali, avocado, chili, coyote, tomato, and chocolate. I did not know that. That's kind of interesting. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, informative little biodex. I always, I like to imagine that Albot is the one telling us those things. So he's just like riding around telling us that. All right, this wolf is getting hungry, so let's actually come down and let's see what he's going to focus on eating. Following them around, is it this baby bunny? <gasps> it was a baby bunny. Did it feed him? And it fed him 100%. All right. So, oh, and now he's taking a nap. Oh, that actually looks pretty cool. Okay, hang on, hang on. I'm going to get down here. Hey, stay there for a second. Stay there next to your, your kill. All right, and we're going to get up close and personal. Hold still. Yeah, no, don't. <laughs> there we go. Much better. All right. So there's oh he like it literally held still just long enough for that. That's pretty cool. All right. And what else should we add over here? Hmm. The sand cherry. Oh, the sand cherries are actually pretty cool looking. All right. Hey, hey, hey. Sand cherry. Sand cherry. There we go. Ah, what? <laughs> I guess this is in its flowering stage. That's funny. All right. So uh, is this another baby bunny? Yeah, a lot of jackrabbits. It looks like they're actually getting pretty hungry. So now that I know that the wolves will actually eat jackrabbits, in fact, there goes another jackrabbit. With the antelope dying off so quickly, I would probably put money down that the jackrabbits are part of their the main one of the main parts of their diet. So we'll go ahead and add in more jackrabbits. Look, there's a whole bunch of little baby jackrabbits hopping for their lives over here. Is that jackrabbit? Yep. 
Yep, yep, yep. And then there's a whole bunch of frogs. So I think maybe more frogs too. And these sumac bushes are very quickly are becoming a vital part of the ecosystem. I think they're one of the few things that the animals aren't able to eat, like completely graze down right away. So let's see. Though humans may think the skunk bush is smelly, animals love to eat its berries. You know, it is called the skunk bush sumac. And it hadn't occurred to me that the reason it's called that may be because it stinks. That really didn't occur to me until just now. So if you guys live anywhere near these, I want to know, do they stink? Because I love when you guys are watching and you tell me um, the things that we talk about in Taito Ecology, you tell me what you think about them and if you've seen them before. Like we have a lot of people who see proghorn out West, which is really cool. The skunk, book, uh, skunk bush sumac makes a good home for small animals like birds and rodents. Additionally, its flexible branches are often used by humans for basket weaving. Very cool! And I thought it would make a pretty good home for them because it looks like a place where you could be like, no! Like this little tiny baby bunny. You could be like, no, the wolves are coming! The wolves are coming! And dive into the sumac for cover. That's what it looks like to me. Alright, so we'll add in a lot more spots in fact, I think there's enough work to do in the prairie today. Now that I know our main goal is not only to be adding wolves, and really we're kind of rooting for the wolves here, but we're going to see what happens if they have to compete with other predators. Now that we know that that's going to be one of our main goals, I'm actually pretty excited to try to get the prairie up and going because the other main predators, and let me know what you guys are excited to see the competition begin for, are the badger, the bobcats. We have badgers, bobcats, badgers are omnivores, so the badgers may just decide to focus on eating the plant matter instead of eating the uh, living animals, and so maybe they won't compete, and they'll just end up sharing the same space, or maybe the wolves will just straight up eat the badgers. Then there's the bobcat, which is a medium-sized carnivore, and in that case, I think the bobcat may lose out the wolf, but I'm not sure. Then we've also got the red fox, who's another omnivore, but traditionally the foxes, when we put them down, tend to be focused on eating the rodents. There's the coyote, which would be another large carnivore, and in many areas, wolves and coyotes actually create hybrids, that, and it causes a lot of problems when you're trying to do wolf conservation, just in case you guys didn't know. And that's a big debate over here in North Carolina, and I'll kind of tell you guys about that just really quickly, because it's, it's actually a really important issue. The hybrids between wolves and coyotes are one of the main reasons that most of the red wolves who are left in the wild here in North Carolina get shot and killed. There is is no limitation there's no like uh, you know there's no like endangered species alert on coyotes so you can go ahead and you can take out a coyote on your property no problem well the problem is the red wolves look a lot like coyotes and if so a lot of people will think oh that's a coyote or they'll just use the excuse for shooting the wolf by saying i thought it was a coyote i've heard that one quite a bit too but if they do breed, if they do create hybrids, that raises a new question because they're not purebred red wolves, so they're not part of the endangered species list, but what do you do? And is creating a hybrid species actually a way of the red wolf adapting? So that's a good, a good thing for our pixel biologists to kind of debate in the comments if you guys would like because it's an important subject to consider. That is literally a subject that comes up when it's time to do voting. I'm not joking. The red wolves surviving as an entire species or not is 100% determined on what people will vote when they go to the polls. And those questions and the way people confront those questions of what do we do about hybrids? Do we care about the hybrids? Do we not? Do we say there's a ban on coyote hunting because people are mixing up up or using the excuse of the coyote looking like the red wolf to shoot red wolves. Those are really important things. If you guys care about wolves and you care about the environment, those are things you need to know. So that's why I went off on my little tangent. <sighs> Siri has strong feelings about this if you can't tell. Okay. All right. Moving on. All right. Who else? Who else? Who else? The cougar. The cougar is another large carnivore that we could actually add in. Look at the little frog hop by that we could add in to compete with the gray wolves. And so those are the carnivores that we can put in to compete with the wolves. And eventually we may even add bison. So that's something we could do here at this prairie as well. And I'm very interested to see. So I think that's going to be what we'll do. We're kind of going to have competitions between the wolves and the other, the other like apex predators 
and we'll have to see who wins. And we're not trying to do it in a violent way. We're just trying to do it in a way that might reflect the very real competition between resources that different animals at the top of the food chain have to do. Because if you're at the top of the food chain, you actually tend to have a fewer number of things to eat in a way, if you're not an omnivore. Because the wolves are at the top of the food chain, sure, because they're huge and they can eat all of the things, but they can't eat all the plants. They have to eat the things that eat the plants. So the things that eat the plants have a bigger base of things to eat. So anyway, that's that's back to food pyramid talk and you can tell I'm just in teacher mode. <laughs> Siri, you're not a classroom teacher anymore. <laughs> just calm down. All right, and we're gonna put some honeybees down just because. And then I kind of want to add in some prairie dogs over here. So we're gonna put in a population of prairie dogs. And clearly our antelope, our proghorns are not doing very well over here. I would still like to try adding more in. I don't know if they're gonna make it, <laughs> but maybe they just need to make it long enough to keep our, oh, that's deer. Who do we actually, they're the same in number, so you get 10 of each, depending on who you put down. I'm sorry, Proghorn Antelope, that the first thing you get to see as you are, like, aware and alive is a dead Proghorn Antelope. I'm, I really apologize for that. It's That wasn't my intention. It just sort of happened. All right, I'm going to refill on energy because I think we've earned enough money. And we're starting to get pretty high on the money again, so I'm pretty happy about that. All right, then we'll put some prayer blazing stars. The milk vetch is also a really nice one to put down here and there. It has a lot of leaves. Oh, that's a common milkweed. What? Either of these are really nice to put down everywhere because they have a lot of leaves and can help our species. I'm trying to go for the common milkweed and I keep clicking the wrong thing. Uh, you didn't even have a chance. <laughs> you poor thing. Taken down in your prime. Oh, he was eliminated just like that. Just like that. We'll put some honey mesquites over here. There we go. So there we are, you guys. We're starting to add to it. Hopefully the jackrabbits will breed fast enough that they can keep our wolves alive. And while we are preparing this biome to have the competitors, like the uh, carnivore competitions begin, then we'll have to make sure that we also keep in mind that we need to put down, it appears, tons and tons of jackrabbits and tons and tons of plants for those jackrabbits to eat in order to support those carnivores so we can see who's going to win the competition, who's going to out-eat the other, who's going to just straight-eat the other one up. So, hmm. All right. Well, that's that for here. I'm going to give it just another moment. We'll put down a couple more groups of jackrabbits because I think the jackrabbits reproduce like yeah, they reproduce really quickly, 90 days, and boom, they're ready to have babies. So that's a good thing. And hopefully, oh my gosh, this jackrabbit territory is nothing but babies. <laughs> nothing but juveniles left. This jackrabbit population has one adult and two juveniles left. So yeah, we need to put down some more jackrabbits, and we need to put down some more jackrabbit support, aka more plants. But then we'll have to come back, and in fact, maybe we can just add... There's jackrabbits everywhere here. Look at all of them! Okay, hopefully I didn't add too many in. Eat up, Mr. Wolf. Yep, he's eating a jackrabbit right now. And then we'll have to come back in another three months to the Wolf Prairie biome and see what's going to happen. And if you guys have any advice or hints or suggestions on the things we should put in for the Wolf Prairie wolves, then let me know. All right, run forth the little jackrabbits and breed before the wolves eat you. And I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.